capable of once we're uh, divorced from China. But also, how, how divorced do we need to be? Can we just not continue this relationship? Maybe given a little bit more autonomy maybe not necessarily a huge part of china maybe under not not under beijing's control but still have a cordial relationship with the country can we not do that instead so it's not necessary that hong kong has to carve its own niche without china as such as in without a chinese identity but it would be very exciting to see if if we're given universal suffrage if we're given the right to assert ourselves where hong kong could go with this yeah. And so how do you see that playing out back home in the protests? Um, I think that shared sense of being lost about the future and trying to develop that further. What is your sense on the discourse back home in terms of how people are fighting for a, the particular future that they're articulating? Well, I think the bizarre thing is no one thought it would turn this violent. Um but it's also not surprising. I mean, I was there the first few months of um, the protests, and it was horrible to see a city that I've grown up and loved to be demolished in such a way. Um, and it's only getting worse. But by and large, everyone does support the protests. Everyone does think that this is something that was bound to happen. Um, if not now, then later. We we just had um, Occupy Central back in 2014, and that was a tumultuous time, but only an indication of what was yet to come. And these protests are not going to stop. Even if Carrie Lam gives in to our five demands and Beijing gives us what we want, I feel like the protests are only going to get more violent as 2047 comes closer, which is when we will officially become where we're due to officially become a part of China again. It's interesting to see how the discourse is shaping up because it feels uh, it's it's almost as though we don't have a singular uh, a single objective, a single leader, a single voice. There's just a lot of resentment. Um, and while Hong Kongers agree on the five demands, who's to say what we're going to demand next after that? So um, I think it's important to have a conversation at a later stage to figure out what it is what what the direction should be that hong kong should be taking but i think that's a conversation for later i feel like right now the objective is these five demands they need to be met and until then this is going to continue it's only going to escalate it's only going to get worse and it's not good for the economy it's not good for hong kong or china's image abroad so everyone's starting to notice and i think it's going to be a much bigger problem um, for both China and Hong Kong if the demands of the protesters are not met. So there are some people who look at the violence in Hong Kong and they are in solidarity with the pro-democracy sentiments mm -hmm. of the protesters. At the same time, they might see some of the demands, um, which is pardon all the rioters or um, retract the riot statement. So they see these two things, the democracy and then some of the violence by some people. And then they see that the protesters are going to eventually think about the future. How would one, I guess, comfort or soothe, for lack of a better word, explain to some people who are hesitant in their support how all of these different elements will come together in the future? Well, that's really hard to say. How, how do you comfort anyone when we're, we're not really sure where any of this is going? I feel like what the protesters are asking for is important, and to those who may not be as comfortable with the idea of um, the rioters not being labeled as rioters. And it's obviously, it's come at a huge cost. As I said, I feel as though the people are with the protesters. Um, they are not happy about the vandalism. But the great thing is the protesters are trying very hard to appease the people of Hong Kong. Um, for example, a couple of the Cross Harbor Tunnel, the Cross Harbor Tunnel, the Tolo uh, Tunnel, they were shut the last few days, but they opened a couple of lanes in between because they didn't want the local population to feel as though they were fighting against them. And the protesters do come out with these moves once in a while, almost at every point, um, to appease the people as much as they can to make them understand that we're fighting for us. We're fighting for our future. Um, please stand with us. So I feel like as as much as the MTR disruptions harms commuters and 
is is problematic for a lot of people and while people don't understand this and are frustrated on a day-to-day basis that they are still in support of what is going on and what the protesters are fighting for i remember one of the protest one of the initial protests right after the tear gas one of the tear gas episodes uh, there's a whole line of protesters just handing out water bottles to everyone um we had a couple of neighborhoods uh, na- neighbors that had opened up their houses for protesters whose parents wouldn't allow them to come back home um so they would allow the protesters to come and sleep at their house there's a lot of solidarity amongst the people even though they don't show it, even though ev- not everyone's wearing black black masks and not everyone is out in the streets vandalizing and, and throwing bricks and moving cones around, everyone, for the most part, there are a lot of people who support the cause. And so, if you don't mind my asking, how about the friends with similar backgrounds or similar accesses to language and the ability to move in and out of the city? what would they be thinking about with regards to their relationship in Hong Kong? Yeah, it's actually um, very interesting because I have not spoken to a lot of my friends who have seen themselves in Hong Kong. A lot of my um, other Indian or Pakistani friends who have decided to get married and settle in Hong Kong and their spouses or they they themselves have businesses and work in Hong Kong. I don't know how they're feeling right now about being anywhere else and whether they've even thought of that um i feel like there's this this was initially the problem with uh the ethnic minority population especially um more of the adults than the young youngsters um so a lot of people my age obviously got involved with the protests and feel very strongly about one side or the other um one side more often than uh the other but a lot of our parents um are very detached from the issue they see it as just something that's happening in Hong Kong um, that's hindering their business, that's hindering their daily life, that's a problem. But they don't actually see it as, this is my city and this is my issue. Because they're first generation. They grew up elsewhere and they've come to Hong Kong to work and they've raised their kids here and families here. So they've been here for 30 years, but they're not very vocal within they they don't they don't have ownership of hong kong the way we do so it would be very interesting to see what i feel like the my parents or or parents of my friends would probably be very happy retiring to india and just moving back and not looking back at hong kong twice if anything was to go um in the wrong direction but I don't know what people my age would do. I feel like we have opportunities, of course. Maybe maybe something happens and in, in, in Beijing and Shanghai seem like more lucrative options. I don't know. Or maybe everyone moves to, moves to Singapore, which would be, you know, um, quite great. But I just don't know what they would do. For the most part, it seems like they don't want to give up on the city. A place we all call home and we hate to see what's happening there. So. I I feel like if every other Hong Konger does not have that option to leave, we would stand by that and we would do the same. Obviously, if push comes to shove and other people have other options, they will flee as much as they can. But I really don't think that's going to happen. I think that everyone will stand by Hong Kong, will stand by the adversities, will stand by the issues um, and, and move on, continue living there. Um, and see this as an episode that is necessary, but uh, that is problematic, but necessary, um, and, and live life as it were. I realize that that leads me to a question in which I think many people in the fit city definitely feel that peaceful protests didn't lead to anything, especially after Umbrella in 2014. So now that we're moving to violence, um, is there a similar kind of bright line um, for violence and its efficacy as there is for peaceful protest? At a certain point, violent protest takes a lot more energy than peaceful protest. Is there anybody or any thoughts going around, or yourself personally, at which point you say, I guess I'm just going to have to stand up every single day, but no matter how many things I smash, or how many um, delaying actions I can do, it doesn't seem to be ringing with the powers that be? Well, if we take a look at the Arab Spring... As an example, it was only when everything got extremely violent and there was large civil unrest in in 
the different countries um, during the, those two years that the governments were able to hear and action was taken and, and they were rid of all their dictators and born as new countries. I feel like this is finally what Hong Kong has been pushed to. I do think, uh, obviously, I'm I'm more of a peace-loving person and I do believe in peaceful protests, but you're right, it's been years and we've been trying that and we've gotten nowhere and it just seems there's just so much more energy this time around than even 2014 and it's incredible to see the anger um the passion and the frustration that people have every day they say that this is we're done we're done with trying to explain to them peacefully and i I sincerely believe that this is one of the only ways out right now, and this is the only way we can get get the people to listen. Following on the perspective from within Hong Kong, we have an interviewee from mainland China who will remain anonymous. They will be sharing their experience as a mainland journalist. Thank you so much today for uh, being with us. So can you give us a brief self-introduction? I live in Shanghai, China, and uh, I'm a journalist. How closely have you been following the Hong Kong issue at the moment? Not that much close because I'm a journalist, but I don't do my concern. Um, is not that I had nothing to do with Hong Kong, but uh, I still, but I still follow the things. But not that much close because what think what I I can do nothing, and I've not even changed it. I've not uh, talked it publicly. So um, what happened in Hong Kong now makes me uh, anxious and make me sad. So I don't want to pay that much attention to that place yet. Can you elaborate more on that? What do you mean that you cannot talk publicly about Hong Kong? Yeah, because uh, you can only have one voice. Because I, I know that um, uh, I'm a journalist, and I know that uh, when we have published some news uh, about Hong Kong, they've never, what well, the comment to, uh, to, uh, to us is that uh, you just report what Xinhua news agency do. Yeah. So you don't make your own comments. Yeah. And uh, you don't, uh, you cannot uh, have um, have your own journalists uh, publish your own things there. So you gotta do what we told you to do. Yeah, that's what from the upper level tell us. So yeah, so we cannot. Um, the only voice we can hear is from the Xinhua News Agency or CCTV. Or, yeah. So the Xinhua News Agency is a state controlled, basically a, a news agency. Yeah, it's like just like uh, uh, it's Xinhua Shu, yeah, Xinhua News Agency. Yeah, it's um, uh, state owned and uh, they give information and uh, about uh, to you. Okay, so basically that's the only source of information that people can get in mainland regarding anything about yeah, Hong Kong. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, publicly it's the only voice, the only information we can know. But uh, now we have internet, people. In China, can also access the internet, although we have some censorship. Um, so we also have WeChat, and uh, we have the how to say official accounts from yeah. the WeChat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now we may call it V Media. Yeah. Uh, so they also publish some news. Uh, uh, maybe some their uh, own experience or what they have seen or what they have heard from the uh, like the New York Times or this kind of thing. So um, publicly, you can only have one choice, but uh, uh, you can access to some other voice, other information. Yeah. How is it that the Hong Kong situation right now is making you sad and anxious? Yeah, okay. From my perspective, I do like Hong Kong. Uh, like I said, when I was a child, yeah, I've seen too many Hong Kong songs, uh, the Cantonese songs, uh, the movies, the TV series, and uh, so I have some uh, connection with Hong Kong. Yeah, I uh, yeah, just like what I live in Shanghai. I wish this city um, be prosperous and uh, can be better, and uh, this has um, some peaceful atmosphere. But now things are totally different. But uh, I cannot change it. I cannot control it. And uh, no one hears my voice about uh, what to do in Hong Kong. So why I give that much concern about this place? It just makes me sad. Yeah, I guess I'll explain it to you. Okay. But if given the chance, what would be your your thoughts on how we should, you know, deal with the Hong Kong situation? Yeah, okay. Um, what I think uh, Hong Kong is happening now is 
exactly have something to do with the common value. 